Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce a guest from Japan. Dr. Isam Rashid received his bachelor's in scientific computing in 1998 and his master's in computer science in 2002, both from Suez Canal University, Ismailia, Egypt. He received a PhD in computer science from the University of Tsukuba, Japan in 2010. From 2010 to 2012, he was a research fellow of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, JSPS, at the University of Tsukuba. He served as assistant professor of computer science at the Department of Mathematics, Faculty of Science, Suez Canal University from 2012 to 2016. Since then, he was promoted to associate professor at Suez Canal University, Egypt, and worked at the Faculty of Informatics and Computer Science of the British University in Egypt on secondment. Currently, he is a research associate professor at Nagoya Institute of Technology. His research interests include medical image processing, data analysis and visualization, deep learning and pattern recognition. Dr. Rochet is a IEEE senior member and associate editor of IEEE Access. He is also a recipient of the Egyptian National Doctoral Scholarship in 2006. JSPS Postdoctoral Fellowship in 2010, JA MIT Best Presentation Awards in 2008 and 2012, and the Chairman Award of the Department of Computer Science, University of Tsukuba in 2010. He participated also as PI and co-PI for several externally funded projects. So today I have the great pleasure to have him as a speaker and his presentation is entitled Human Head Models with Deep Learning Enable Dielectric Properties. So Isam, I'm really glad to have you here and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the nice presentation and for the invitation to be here. It's my pleasure to uh, to be uh, with uh, your group now and uh, to introduce uh, current research we have done here in Nagoya Institute of Technology. Uh, as you remember, the last time we took about the, this kind of uh, research about uh, developing head models and uh, uh, the challenges that we have faced here. The, uh, to uh, actually try to find some solution based on deep learning. So today I will briefly uh, discuss the problems and, and the challenges we have with this application. And then the, I will discuss some uh, uh, solution that we have proposed along the past uh, one and a half year. So uh, I thank you again for the invitation and the uh, let's start. So uh, uh, actually, uh, the talk today is about the generation of the human head models uh, by using the deep learning technology. And uh, uh, I'll start with uh, the basic idea about this problem. So uh, the main application here is uh, related to electromagnetic dosimetry application. So we assume that the uh, uh, we would like to sense some uh, uh, physical properties and uh, such as uh, doing a brain stimulation of some patient. And to do this, the main uh, applications is actually based on some uh, electromagnetic signals. To do so, uh, we would like to understand the, how the stimulation is affecting the, um, uh, the uh, different tissues, especially in the head, or let's say, especially in the brain. So uh, this application is actually commonly used for the 
diagnosis, rehabilitation, and also for the uh, surgery mapping, assuming that we have some patient and this patient that it, it has some tumor in some specific place, and we would like to sense the location where we would like to do the resection or something. So in some cases, the brain stimulation is used to do the brain mapping and uh, detection where the exact position to do the surgery. So the problem or actually, or the main challenge here that the, as you know, that the, we have a, a real challenge when the anatomy is different from one person to another. So it is actually time consuming because the current process to uh, do the brain stimulation or brain mapping is that the first we start with the uh, medical images. And then the, we do some kind of segmentation to identify different tissue. And then we conduct some simulation to understand the distribution of the electric field or uh, how each part of the brain is stimulated or how the distribution of electric field at different parts of the brain before actually going to implement this in reality. So we would like to find a good way that is fast, robust, and accurate to do the brain stimulation in a, a very specific way. And when we call uh, a specific way, that means that we would like to, for example, to stimulate some part of the brain with the maximum intensity as much as we can. And at the same time, we would like to reduce the stimulation at the other parts. And this is what happened in the, when we uh, speak about the rehabilitation, assuming that we have patient and that patient have some problem with some region of the brain, and we would like to do a electrical stimulation of this region. So we are actually focusing on the focality, how, where, where exactly we do the position of the uh, stimulation device so that we can achieve the best result. If you look here at this uh, figure, these are the uh, two famous applications for the brain stimulation. The first one is called TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation, where we have the stimulation devices look like the figure eight coil. And it is actually located uh, above the head or above the skull. And the other application, as you see here, this is called the TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation, where we have some uh, two electrodes attached to the patient. And then we have some, uh, a weak electrical current that pass through this electrode to do the stimulation. So to look at the uh, experimental or how it works here. So let's think about the TMS at the beginning. So this is actually a photo taken in our lab here where some student is volunteer here to do the experiment with the TMS. You can see that the, the patient should be some kind of uh, sitting in a relaxed chair. And here the coil is with hand held here. And then this device is actually uh, some, uh, mm, how to say, some markers to be, uh, uh, how to say, identify the position of the coil. And then uh, the electric field is passing through this coil and then we have some kind of electrical distribution inside the plate, something like this. So before doing the experiment, we would like to uh, map or uh, do the simulation studies uh, using the, the uh, mainly MRI images so we can identify exactly how the brain is stimulated or how the distribution of electric field inside the brain before going into the real experiment. So uh, the, 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 the pipeline is actually look, around, look at the, what we have here on the right side. So we have some anatomical images, and mainly in this application, we are using the MRI images. And then we implement some kind of segmentation. So we have some head model. And then head model here, we actually have a segmentation of all head tissue. That's not only brain tissues, because uh, we consider the, uh, the electrical distribution passing through the brain tissue and also non-brain tissue. 
And then the next step, we use some kind of uh, tissue-based conductivity or the, we use the electrical conductivity value assigned to each tissue to construct what we call the volume conductor. And then after computing the volume conductor, we use uh, some kind of simulation and studies to simulate what will happen when we assign some uh, electrical field very close to the brain. So the challenges here is uh, um, one, one problem is that the segmentation of non-brain tissue is not very common. Uh, if you look at the literature of the image segmentation from the medical imaging point of view, most of the research is actually interested in segmenting brain only or the, some abnormality in the brain. But the non-brain tissue is actually of less importance from the diagnosis point of view. So uh, when we try to do the segmentation or apply some segmentation approaches to segment the non-brain tissue, it becomes more difficult. <clears throat> the other challenge is that the structure MRI, as you know, that the, it's actually very highly dependent on the machine. So we can have a, a grayscale variations if we change the um, equipment that's used for the acquisition of the MRI. And the last challenge is the inter and intra-subject variability. So we need to consider the variations between each subject. So what we have done here, or what we have looked here is, uh, this is the standard pipeline, which I will go through this presentation to explain what we have done here to change this pipeline from the standard method to the uh, new method that is based on the uh, deep learning. Again, we start with anatomical image. We apply some kind of segmentation to identify different tissues, not only the brain, but also non-brain tissues. Then we use the, uh, 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 electrical conductivity or the, let's say the dielectric properties to generate the volume conductor. And finally, we apply some kind of simulation uh, to simulate the effect of TMS to have the uh, field map here or electric field map in the brain. So the first step is that the, uh, we try to study how to use the deep learning uh, to solve this problem. And I think everyone here is aware about the deep learning. It becomes now the a trending uh, technique that, uh, uh, yeah, we can say that uh, you are working on the deep learning or you are working in some, something else. So everyone now knows about deep learning and how it, it has a, a very uh, large effect in different imaging applications. So, the, what we think is that, that we have images from different domains. The first one is in the anatomical domain and the second one is, let's say a segmented image or labeled image. And we would like to map these two images. So we need to find some kind of structure that link these two images from the two different domains. So the problem here with the segmentation is that as we uh, discussed before, that the segmentation is actually uh, time consuming and the accuracy is not the best, especially when we consider the non-print issue. So we try to find some way to replace the standard segmentation method. What we have done here is that the, we designed the following network. And as you can see that the, the input is a single uh, MRI image. This is actually T1 MRI. And then we have the, um, we divided the image or divided the output into different branches. This is the structure where we have the uh, two output branches only. So we decided that the output will be a binary and every branch is set to segment only a single tissue. So what we have in uh, an actual implementation is that we have N branch network. So the encoders is uh, based on the convolutional neural network. You can see that the one unit here of the encoder is based on the convolution module uh, followed by the patch normalization and then implement the failure. And then we have here each branch demonstrate the uh, deconvolution, which is also uh, uh, based on the, uh, how to say, 
convolution, uh, deconvolution, patch normalization, and uh, sigmoid function. The interesting point about this structure is that we found that it, it actually looks like the unit structure or multiple unit structure. We have found that the, when we do uh, this way and then that we do the segmentation as a binary image at each branch, the, 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 the segmentation accuracy becomes higher, especially for the uh, non brain tissues. So I would like to show you some results here. So this is how the segmentation look like when we have some image and we would like to do the segmentation of uh, brain and non-brain tissues. So we target in this application 13 head major tissues. And uh, this is some example of the result we have achieved here. So uh, in, in the first column here, we have the MRI. In the second column here, we have the, what we call the ground through segmentation that is based on the uh, semi-automatic method that includes some uh, manual editing of the segmentation. And then the next column is actually the segmentation uh, around the different orientation, like the axial, sagittal, and coronal directions. So we can see that the, we have a little bit change uh, when we uh, change the orientation of the segmentation slicing. Uh, but uh, the, the difference is not so much. Uh, how to say? The, the difference is actually around the mm, tissues which have a very small regions. Like, for example, this yellow car here represents Dora, the, the very thin layer around the brain. So we can find here a um, large differences in segmentation. So this results are obtained by using the um, MRI T1 images as an input, one millimeter resolution. Uh, the training we have used 10 subjects and the testing we used eight subjects. Uh, and uh, we segment the, uh, as I say before, the 13 tissues of the head. If you look here from the, uh, 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 dice coefficient point of view, we have find actually the, the a variation between the segmentation accuracy of different tissues. So for tissues which actually appear with high contrast, like for example, the gray matter, white matter, uh, skin, we can achieve a very high accuracy along the, uh, all the uh, eight subjects. But for other tissues, which is actually appearing low contrast, like the dora, which is appearing in a very small region, or the low contrast, like the blood vessels, we actually achieve a very low results compared to the other tissues. So uh, the segmentation is not uniform in for different tissues. And these are comparison with the standard unit. So this is the segmentation, which we assume that this is the true segmentation. And this is the segmentation using forknet, and this is the segmentation by using uh, the standard unit. As you can see that the, here, the, also in the forknet, we can find some defects in some region, but uh, when we do a combination along the three orientation of the slicing, we can uh, overcome these kind of defects. And here from the dias coefficients uh, point of view, uh, we can also see that the, the, the segmentation by using fork net uh, outperform the standard unit. But in some cases, uh, the difference is not significant. In some cases, the difference is actually uh, almost the same uh, quality. Then after doing the segmentation, we try to do the TMS uh, simulation. So what we have done is uh, very simply, we, we uh, implement finite element method by to simulate the uh, TMS uh, simulation. And we assume that we would like to target uh, uh, a very specific region of the brain, which is the hand motor area. And these are the results from the standard segmentation and followed by the segmentation around 
or uh, obtained from the front slicing direction. And then finally, the segmentation, which uh, obtained from the aggregation of the three directions. So when you look at the distribution of electric field at the hand motor area, you can see that, that there is no significant difference uh, from the uh, standard segmentation that's actually time consuming and the forklift segmentation, which can be done in few seconds. And you can see here, uh, this is the error map uh, around the hand motor area. Uh, this is also uh, another results from five different subjects. So the segmentation is done by the uh, forklift, and then after that we apply the TMS simulation, and you can see that the, also the error uh, can be vary from one subject to another. So in this subject, we can see that uh, we have here a high uh, error uh, in the hand motor area. So next step, we think about the, not only the main uh, head structure, but also we look at the uh, deep brain structure in which the uh, segmentation is more challenging that we would like to segment the deep structure like thalamus, codate, potamine. So uh, we select seven deep structures and then we implement another structure of the four planets. We call it the sub four planet architecture. Again, uh, we, we have the single image as an input and then we have the uh, multi output and we assign a binary image that should be allocated to different uh, deep brain structure. So the change here from the uh, fork net is that the, in this case, we don't need actually the non-brain tissue. So first we do the skull stripping. And then after that, we use a, a brain only as an input image to do the segmentation of the uh, deep brain structure. So the pipeline here for the sub forklift is as follow, assuming that we have the T1 image, we apply the segmentation by using forknet. So we have the segmentation of 13 head tissues. After that, we use the segmentation result to do the skull stripping by excluding all the tissues that is not related to the brain tissue. Then we apply the sub forknet segmentation to highlight the deep brain structure like this one. Then we combine the segmented uh, deep print structure into the 13. So we will have the uh, a 20 segmentation or 20 tissue segmentation uh, of the brain tissue. This is uh, step by step how we do the uh, deep brain uh, segmentation by using the fork net for the standard 13 head tissue and the sub fork net for the uh, deep brain structure. Uh, we also implement the uh, sub fork net by using the uh, different slicing directions of the brain. So we actually do the segmentation by using three different network. Every network is trained by using a, a, a different set of images obtained from different orientation. And then after obtaining the segmentation from each network, we aggregate them into a single uh, volume. Then after that, we, uh, we, 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 we test the segmentation result uh, for the uh, TDCS application, not TMS now. So we have also 18 subjects, uh, one millimeter resolution, and then uh, we, do, we did the segmentation, uh, 13 main tissue and seven uh, deep regions. Uh, after that, we, uh, this is how the network is trained. We use a cross entropy loss function minimized by Adam Alvarez. Uh, the training for four plate takes about 34, uh, 43 minutes uh, with the structure of leaving one out. After that, we assign the value of the conductivity or electrical conductivity for each tissue at this value. Then 
Uh, these are the results of the uh, segmentation from different subjects. You can see here the uh, this is a whole brain and this is a selected ROI here. This is what we have the two segmentation that's manually segmentation and this is the segmentation from the sub fork net. Uh, in some cases, we can have some defects, not accurate segmentation. It's actually very difficult to do the segmentation of deep brain structure. And this is uh, the numbers of the dice coefficients by uh, segmentation of uh, every deep structure. And then we find that the aggregation again uh, have achieved a higher uh, segmentation quality compared to the segmentation along different orientation. The interesting point here is that we study the, uh, by using different network depth. And when we say network depth here, we, have, we, we mean that we have more layers in the network or the more deep uh, of the network. The problem is that the, we find that the, when we go more deep, the segmentation accuracy is not improved as we expected. So we find that in some cases, or for some structures, the segmentation accuracy stay uh, with almost no change. But for some other structures, when we go more deep, we have a uh, a worse result or a worse segmentation uh, result. We don't know ag exactly why this happened, but the, uh, uh, there are some reports that say that it is not always uh, good to, uh, to have a, a very deep network or to go more deep uh, when we consider the segmentation problem. And then uh, after doing the segmentation of the uh, deep brain structure, we apply the TM TDCS simulation. We consider the following montage. So we have here eight subject. Uh, the blue squares here represent the position of the electrode around the skull. And then we use a, a one millimeter thick rubber sheet inserted into a sponge soaked in normal uh, saline solution. This is the simulation setup for the TDCS. Every electrode is five by five centimeter and uh, five millimeter thickness. And then we have used two milliampere uh, at the top of the center of the rubber. And then the, this is the position of the electrode actually uh, at the position C3 FP2. We, uh, this is from the 1020 uh, international system of the electrode position. Now let's look at the results here. So we investigate different scenarios for the uh, simulation by using TDCS. We assume that first we have the head is segmented by the uh, semi-automatic method and also the deep brain structure is also segmented using the same method. This method is actually a time consuming. It take hours to do the segmentation. So this is how the brain look like, and this is how the deep structures look like when we do this, uh, uh, the stimulation. In the second uh, column here, you see that the head, uh, head means that the main uh, 13 tissues are segmented by using the semi-automatic method, and the deep uh, brain structure is segmented by using the support net. And this is the distribution of the electric field at both. Then we segment the head by using fork net and deep semi-automatic method. And then both of them by using deep blending. And this method is actually the most fastest one. If you look at the distribution of electric field, uh, you can see that, that there is no significant change from the, uh, how to say, visual point of view. But we, when we look at number, we observe actually uh, a little bit uh, small changes in the distribution of electric field, uh, we can see that the, uh, this is uh, on the left side here, we have the global error. And on the right side here, we have the local error. Global error means the, the, uh, the general error around the whole plane and local error means the error in the deep regions only. 
Uh, although we, we have find some, uh, uh, th this is in percentage, of course, we have some uh, error, error values, but the, uh, this, this, uh, this error range is actually can be ignored when we consider the, uh, uh, the computation time. So what we have done here is that uh, we can replace the standard pipeline by removing the segmentation, which is a time consuming process by using forknet or sub forknet, which can quickly compute the head model from the anatomical images without considering the time consuming uh, process for the segmentation, even for the main structure or for the deep structure. Now the question is that, uh, do we really need to do the segmentation? So uh, can, can we go beyond the segmentation and compute the volume conductor, which represent the distribution of the electrical properties without going through the segmentation? So what we have done here is the following. We uh, try a different structure of uh, deep neural network. Again, this is a convolution neural network uh, designed by using different layers. In that case, we have used a combinations of the two modalities. So we have T1 and T2 MRI images. So we have two inputs. Everyone go through an encoder. And then we have a single decoder. And the, we, the target here is to estimate the volume conductor exact or directly from the anatomical images without uh, considering the segmentation. So how it work? So very simply, we have the two images. First, we do the registration, normalization, and bias correction. So to be sure that the two images are aligned to each other to avoid any artifacts in the training. Then we do the segmentation to obtain the standard head model. This can be done by the semi-automatic method or by the um, forknet. The next step is we use the tissue-based conductivity value, and then we assign these values to the head model. So we have a volume conductor. Then by using a set of uh, anatomical images and the corresponding volume conductor, we do training for the uh, continent. And then finally, if we have a new patient or new subject, we can use a continent to estimate the volume conductor of this uh, new patient. What we have observed here is the following, that uh, when we use a, a deep learning uh, estimation for the volume conductor, it becomes, uh, it represents a more realistic structure. So we observe that the, the estimated uh, volume conductor becomes uh, more closer to uh, the anatomical images than the standard method that is based on the segmentation first and then assigning the electrical field distribution. As you can see here, the, the, uh, the eye looks here the, as a, uh, 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 I would say a uniform value, but when we look here, it looks like that the distribution of the um, uh, tissue conductivity are more uh, like uh, to the uh, anatomical image. So how we do this, we do again, we do 18 subjects, one millimeter resolution. We do the segmentation by using the fork net. And then we do the, uh, uh, training by using 13 branches of the uh, fork net. And then we use this conductivity value to uh, generate the volume conductor for each case. And here are some results from the output of the network. So in the first two column, you can see the uh, anatomical images T1 and T2. And the third, uh, column, you can see the what we call the uniform conductivity. Uniform conductivity here means that we did the segmentation and then we assign the uh, electrical conductivity per each tissue. 
And this is the result from the continent. You can see that the, some arrows here are pointing to region where the uh, continent are more likely to be similar to the anatomical structure more than the uh, uh, using the segmentation and then assign the uh, uniform conductivity value. If we enlarge some uh, part, you can see here that uh, actually we can have here uh, some sharp edges due to the segmentation. But here we can say that uh, we can have a, a smooth transition from one region to the other, which is, uh, we think it's more realistic or more close to the real cases. So to validate the, how this uh, result is correct or uh, close to the real uh, situation, so we select some small regions here and we try to compute how uh, the estimated electrical properties or electrical conductivity values uh, estimated by the continent and compare it with the standard value. For example, in the white matter, actually the value is 0.07, that's a network chain. And uh, when we look at the, uh, 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 the region one, which is here from the white matter, we can find that the range is actually very close to this value. The same for gray matter, fat. Hmm. The bone is a little bit uh, shifted down. Uh, how to say it? CSF is a little bit also shifted down. But in general, we can find that the estimated uh, value for the electrical conductivity is very close to the standard. The interesting point here is that uh, when we try to do the uh, testing by using images that is generated by using different scanners, so we have actually obtained some images from uh, cancer imaging archive that is obtained from different uh, scanners, uh, GE, Philips, and Siemens. And we have tried uh, to do the, uh, uh, the estimation of electric field conductivity by different patients. So this is a, the first one was obtained from GE. And uh, this is T1, T2, these are the network input. And you can find here the uh, estimated electrical conductivity inside the brain. Uh, this is the second sub subject from Philips scanner, and this is the third subject from Siemens scanner. And then we validate different regions here, and we check how uh, how these regions are, uh, or how the electrical conductivity at different regions, how it is close to the real values. So. You can see here that the, the, for the first case, this is the distribution of the gray scale in T1 and the gray scale in T2. And this is how the electrical conductivity estimated uh, in the first subject. So you can see that here that the indifferent scanner, uh, the gray scale is actually have uh, some variations. Uh, when we acquire the data by using different scan. But the interesting point that the, the variation is a little bit less when it is estimated uh, by using the content. So it can handle the variations obtained uh, uh, from the uh, changing of the imaging facility. Uh, in the next step, we try the simulation for the TMS. So we have a figure eight coil. We simulate the figure eight coil over the motor area. And then we use a SPFD method with the successive over relaxation method. And then the, we assume the isotropic uniform tissue conductivity. And then the, these are the results from the standard. Standard here means that the, we follow the standard pipeline. We do the segmentation and then we assign the conductivity value for each tissue, which we call uniform a distribution of the electrical conductivity. And this is a brain map or electric field map when we have uh, 
uh, electrical distribution is obtained by using condiment. These are different subjects, four subjects. And this is a distribution around the motor cortex. This is the error map. You can see here that the, uh, uh, the error map is different from one subject to the other. And this is uh, how the electric field is distributed around the head. And this is the uh, error uh, uh, we computed from uh, these two images around the head. So if we look more deep at the images for the uh, around the head region, you can see that the, the top images represent the uh, electrical distribution or the distribution of the electric field when we use the standard method. And uh, below, you can see the distribution of electric field when we use a continent. The interesting point here is that uh, we can have here some kind of artifacts, which is, uh, we can say that this artifact is uh, generated because uh, we have a, a sudden change due to the uh, sharp boundaries between different tissues. But these artifacts are actually disappearing here when we use a continent. Uh, it looks more smooth distribution of the electric field. Uh, the same phenomena can be observed in uh, different subjects. Then we think of, to extend the continent. So we do the estimation of the only the electrical conductivity, which is uh, uh, highly related to the case of the TMS and TDCS applications. But in other applications, uh, we need more um, dielectric properties of the brain. So we change the structure of the continent to have multiple output. And then we try to estimate the conductivity, permittivity, and tissue density. So we came to the following structure where we have the input is T1 and T2 images. And the output is a, a sigma here is a electrical conductivity. And this is a, a permittivity, and this represents the tissue density. Again, uh, the network is actually based on the convolution neural network with different structure each time. So each block of this is can be understand from this the map key here. I will not go into details, but we can directly uh, go to the experiment. We simulate the uh, radio frequency exposure scenario. Uh, this is actually very similar to what's happened when you are using mobile phone to uh, very close to your head. So we assume that we have some uh, antenna here and this antenna will do the exposure of radio frequency with different, uh, with different frequencies. So we simulate 0.9, 1.8 and three gigahertz. And then we try to uh, look at the SAR values inside the print when we use a standard method and when we use a continent. So these are the results when we have the, um, how to say, uh, the segmentation and then assigning the uh, dielectric properties. That is a uh, conductivity shown here and the permittivity showing here and tissue density showing here. On the left side, these are the value that computed by using standard method, which means that we do the segmentation. And after that, we assign a uniform value for each tissue. On the right side here, these are the estimation of electrical conductivity, permittivity, and tissue density by using uh, continent. Of course, you can observe that, for example, for the tissue density, the, the, the image uh, 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 contrast looks much higher when we use a standard method than here. Uh, and also you can think that the boundaries here, we have a very sharp boundaries, but here the boundaries actually is more closed, as you can see. But from the quantitative point of view, we can, we can say that the, um, how to say, the estimated dielectric properties uh, can work well when we try to do the simulation of the uh, 
target application. So these are another results here. So actually when we change the frequency of the antenna from 0.9 gigahertz to three gigahertz, we have a different values of electrical conductivity and permittivity. So the interesting point is that the, these are the standard method and these are the learning phase method or this is the continent values. So we can see the high matching between the result obtained from the two methods in uh, terms of the, uh, uh, how to say, uh, variation of the uh, distribution of electric field or the permittivity or the tissue uh, density. So we try to uh, validate uh, how much variation we have. So uh, here we have the, uh, each column with different color represent a different frequency. The blue is 0.9 gigahertz, the orange is 1.8 and the green is three gigahertz. The column value represent the standard value for the, uh, uh, here we are talking about the electric conductivity. And the bar here represent the how much variation we can achieve when we use continent. So we can see that the, for some tissues, like for example, the mm, CSF, uh, white matter, gray matter, the, the variation is not so much, but the, again, for the DORA, we can find the variation is quite large. The same case can also observe when we talk about the permittivity. And also we can see here from the uh, tissue density. So now let's look at the uh, SAR values. So we try to compute the SAR distribution that is caused inside the brain when we have an uh, antenna. So these are results from 0.9 gigahertz. This is the MRI image, and this is a magnified region here. So this is the distribution of SAR values inside the brain when we use the standard method which means that uh, we have here including the segmentation. But when we use the continent, so we can have almost the same distribution, but it looks more smoother. Something like um, if we apply some Gaussian smoothing or something to these values. This is the standard along different direction. And you can see here, uh, the distribution of the SAR values are almost the same. Uh, uh, but with different, uh, how to say, the, the learning based method or by using the continent, we have a more uh, smooth values. And here the distribution actually, when we use the different frequencies with the same subject, when we increase uh, actually the, the, the frequency, we will have a more sharp uh, values, but less deep. So the concentration becomes here around the surface with higher concentration values. But when we have a low frequency, we can have a more deep uh, distribution of the SAR value, but of less uh, uh, intensity value. And here the, it shows clearly uh, the error obtained from one subject. This at 0.9 gigahertz, 1.8 and three gigahertz the standard method and uh, by using continent and uh, here the error values. And here we have some numbers that represent the error when we have different subjects. So the error is still marginal. So we can say that the it, it, it can be useful to use a continent to, for uh, a simulation for this application. So uh, to put it all together or to highlight what we have done here. Now let's uh, consider that we have some anatomical images and we would like to look at the distribution of electric feed in the brain. The first approach we have done is the following. We developed some a deep learning segmentation called Forknet that do the segmentation of different tissues. 
and then we do a combination of these tissue to have the whole head model. We use the tissue properties or the electrical distribution at each tissue. And then we apply some uh, simulation um, uh, to estimate the distribution of electric field. The next step or the next approach we have done is that the, we actually added the more imaging modality. So we have T1 and T2. Uh, from 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 M1 and M2, we uh, we we develop uh, another uh, machine learning uh, network, which we call the Continent, in which we can estimate the different electrical properties, which is non-uniform distribution of the electrical properties, like the electrical conductivity, permittivity, and tissue density. And these values, by using this value, we can actually ignore the using of tissue properties here. So we can directly using the head model and the distribution of the electrical properties to generate the uh, distribution of electric field inside the brain. What we would like to do in the future is the following. Uh, we actually would like to do a more personalized simulation so what will happen if we consider the different setup of the coil um, rotation, tilting, position, and orientation? And then how can we model the position of the coil with the anatomical imaging data to directly estimate the distribution of electric? This is actually a more challenging problem which, are, uh, which, which we are doing um, uh, uh, the, um, investigating how to implement right now. So we still um, uh, uh, trying different architecture that can um, combine the anatomical images with different orientation or positioning uh, of the uh, simulation setup to obtain directly the distribution of electric field inside the brain, which will be more efficient than uh, what we have uh, done before because uh, in in all of these steps we we need to do the electromagnetic simulation at the last step but the, how to implement also the electromagnetic simulation in a one step um, by using deep learning structure so, so to conclude that the, the, this talk is about the pipeline for brain simulation application we have discussed the, the standard pipeline and how we try to change this pipeline to a more efficient one. More efficient being that we try to do the estimation of the distribution of electric field quickly and more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, we discussed a point where we uh, uh, do the segmentation of uh, different head tissue. And then also we discussed uh, um, deep learning architecture, which can uh, do the estimation of the volume conductor without having the segmentation. Uh, what I would like to note here that in, in, in this research direction, we actually having a lot of space for new insight and research problem. That is diff that's actually requires uh, a lot of investigation by using the deep learning and machine learning technology how to do the estimation of the electric field in brain in one show, as I show in the last slide. So uh, it is not clear uh, up to now how we can combine all uh, the different parameters in a single um, architecture so that we can directly estimate the distribution uh, from the anatomical images. Uh, also, mm, there is a space that uh, uh, we need to include different anatomical features like, like the nerve modeling or anisotropy uh, um, feature of the different tissues of the brain. Uh, we still have the space for uh, space uh, like the um, accuracy, speed, or having the architecture that is more generic. And also, we are uh, looking for... Uh, a higher uh, resolution uh, uh, imaging uh, that can produce a more accurate distribution of the electric field. 
So finally, I would like to say that this is uh, this work is done by uh, a large group. So this is a this is a photo of the our group here in NITEC, and uh, 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 this QR represents uh, uh, my contact. If you have any question in future, uh, please uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much for your listening. And uh, I'm ready to have your question now. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have some applause for you. So at least a, a virtual audience uh, that is applauding. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really nice presentation. And there's also uh, quite a few questions in the chat. So this is really very nice work and I think this is also very relevant work because I think you can do quite a few simulations with that and estimate the impact of um, radio frequency waves with the brain. So the, so how, how important is it that you actually use more so for the uh, continent you had T1 and T2 uh, maps and the, the question that that I would have is how important is it that you have the two contrasts? So do you even, I mean, MRI can produce many more contrasts. Would it make sense to use more of them? Or is that also a feasibility issue to, because the acquisitions take long? What would be your recommendations here? Uh, so uh, this is a nice question, actually. We have discussed this with uh, uh, people who are uh, collaborating from the medical school uh, who are really interested about the application we are developing. So uh, we have found that the, for the segmentation, it is actually enough to use T1 only. When we add uh, more modalities like T2 or other modalities, we have found uh, improvement, but this improvement actually uh, does not change the um, estimation of the electric field significantly. So we can say that the T1 is enough uh, if we consider the segmentation. But when we go to the estimation of the uh, non-uniform electrical conductivity, we have found that the um, T1 is actually not enough. We need something more. So we have tried to include the T2, which is a uh, more feasible and more available uh, uh, modalities for the MRI, T1 and T2. It's uh, normally acquired together. So we have found that uh, by combining T1 and T2, we find a, a significant improvement in the estimation of the electric field because the estimation of electric field is actually, um, how to say, this is based on the, uh, the distribution of the a percentage of water and the ions in different tissues. So it becomes more accurate when we include both T1 and T2. Mm -hmm. We have not investigated other modalities. I cannot say if we add more, we can have a better result or not. I'm not sure about uh, this, but it's interesting to track. So, yeah. So, th I think that if you're interested in like the bony tissues, then the the ultra short uh, echo trains, the UTE sequences seem to be beneficial. But it also seems that yeah, th that the bone is of course has to be modeled differently. But you will see it by the by the lack of signal, and you can get it from the surrounding tissues. Uh, say, the, the, the volume conductor, if I look at that, it's essentially composed of the tissues, so the tissue segmentation is essentially able to create this volume conductor. But when I look at your images, it seemed that the surface of the brain had this uh, boundary. Is there a, a kind of electrical insulation, or what does that mean? Uh, so volume conductor here means that the, after doing the segmentation, segmentation means that every tissue is labeled. So we refer to the volume conductor when we assign the electrical conductivity value to each tissue. So in that case, we, we, we refer to the model as a volume conductor. So we can use it as the simulation studies. So the difference between the segmentation and the volume conductor is that we replace the labels that identify different tissue with the value that represent the electrical conductivity. And mm -hmm. then we, say, we call it the volume conductor. That's very, very simple. 
Um, so, but there's then a difference in the brain surface than um, in the remaining part of the brain because you could see it very well outlined uh, on the volume conductor images that you showed. Mm, maybe this is this is because that segmentation is uh, represent this this uh, effect. So the segmentation of the brain tissue is actually uh, more accurate compared to the non-brain tissue. Hmm. So I believe that the that the surface of the brain appear more smooth. This is uh, by the segmentation. If I look at the structures of, of Forknet and sub so, so you're, you're splitting essentially these decoding paths, uh, branches. Uh, what, what do you think where, where the main power of Forknet comes from? Is it from, you know, just clustering things together that belong together or um, does it have fewer parameters because you are not fully connected across the, the feature maps? So can you elaborate a bit on this? Uh, yes, this, uh, this is an interesting question. So uh, uh, what we have found is the following. When, when the, the difference between Forknet and the uh, standard unit is uh, we have the uh, split decoders, which means that uh, we have uh, maybe we have more features uh, to be trained independently for each tissue. So when we split the decoders, uh, it appeared that this is a combination of different units that can have more parameters assigned to each tissue so that it can understand exactly how to specifically extract these tissue from the anatomical image. So uh, I believe that it's a matter of number of uh, features or number of variables that's being trained here. So when we split the decoders, it becomes more accurate segmentation because each decoder contains the feature that is related to only one tissue, not a combination of different tissues. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's interesting to see because I mean, technically one could only increase the number of feature maps in, in the decoder branches. But then, of course, they all would interact with each other, and um, you're kind of stopping this in Forknet. And I think that that seems to be so. I guess the comparisons with classical UNet and so on are found to be in the papers, right? Ah, yes, definitely. Yeah, in that paper, this is uh, uh, Forknet is actually uh, we publish in NeuroImage. So in that paper, we compare with uh, uh, we compare this result with UNet. The, um, the the interesting part is that the, every uh, decoding uh, branch consider uh, one tissue to segment and consider all the other tissue as a background. Maybe this is the reason that the, why we have a, a, a good segmentation when we combine everything together, we can find a better result compared to the unit. Yeah, it might be interesting to look at these things also for like vessel segmentation and things like that. Um, when you when you do that in a in a multi segmentation scenario, <clears throat> yeah. quite interesting idea. Um, just a, one one thing about clarification: when you talked about the segmentation ground truth, the the alpha, beta, and gamma essentially r relate to the slice orientation of the ground truth annotation, right? Yes, so this you, is a bit. Using yes, sorry for that. But yeah, yeah uh, uh, and gamma is orientation. That's, that's a quite an amazing study that you went through, semi-automatically relabeling the entire volumes in different orientations. This is this is a lot of work, and I'm I'm actually quite glad that you underwent all of this work, uh, in order to investigate the effect. So that's that's actually pretty cool. Because, so. I think that's a useful study. But, uh, so it's, it seems that the combination of the three is, is beneficial? Uh, yes, definitely. We find that the combination is very, uh, uh, very useful when we... Uh, uh, how to say? The problem usually appears at the boundaries between the tissues, where the uncertainty becomes more uh, higher. So we find that by combining the orientation from different slicing, directions, we came to a more accurate results because uh, we, we, we put some uh, rule to decide it, uh, how, to, how to assign a voxel to some tissue 
based on the segmentation on the three orientation. Mm -hmm. So by this way, we can have more information about the segmentation results, maybe. And is there is there way of of post processing one of the three orientations such that it optimally approximates the union over the three? So uh, like like smoothing filters or stuff like that. Uh, mm, uh, how to say we 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 select a very uh, a very uh, basic. Uh, rule for the selection. So the most voting wins. So uh, we combine the, how much votes each voxel uh, aligned to different tissue, and then the, the the most votes wins, or the the, the most votes uh, decided which um, tissue this voxel to be aligned. Mm -hmm. The problem with that, the, the if if the if the tissue is thin. Like the dura, or appears in low contrast, like the blood tissue, the segmentation becomes harder. It becomes very difficult to decide. Even if you consider the slicing orientations, it's still uh, the segmentation results still not so good. Hmm. Yeah, I remember that we had a lot of trouble uh, with um, knee cartilage segmentation because it's a very thin structure, and then the slice orientation can play a huge impact. Um, so. I'm very glad. So we, we, I mean, we have some some qualitative uh, experience with this, but now um, it would be great if if you can share then also the reference to that paper, because I think this is something when these points come up in in a discussion with a reviewer and so on, then you can say, okay, look, look at uh, Dr. Rashid's study here. He has quantified the effect, and it's uh, it's so and so much. So this this comes up every now and then, but I think it's really relevant work that you looked in this into into so much detail. So this is a very, very very useful side outcome besides the wonderful things that you've been doing. <laughs> that is something that I've been interested in quite some time. It's really nice to see that there is good solid work around that um, you you can simply point at. So, um, to be honest, I'm also impressed that you annotated all of these tissues in the head, not just the brain, but also all of the surroundings. And this is also a study that contains just a lot of time. So this is deeply impressed by the work that you put in there. This is really great to see that also the segmentation of the skull that is typically script, is stripped in, in most of the analysis studies is also done very accurately here. So that's pretty cool. One question. So, so you have the different like, unit the derivatives that you're using now to produce the segmentation or the volume conductor. Have you also considered doing like multitask learning that you produce the segmentation and the volume conductor to see how the two kind of related tasks share information? Yeah, the, this is actually a, a study we are now conducting. So oh. we try to, yes, so now, now we are doing experiment to uh, evaluate uh, what will happen if we, uh, if we do the segmentation by using ForkNet, and if we do generation of the volume conductor directly by using the ContNet, and uh, how uh, the combination can be done. Because uh, actually, uh, the, the segmentation or the uh, annotation uh, of the brain tissue is very useful when we have application that required a quantitative evaluation of the electric field distribution. So you need exactly to know where is this tissue and where is uh, the boundaries. But uh, if, if, if you just uh, want to look at the distribution of electric field, so that segmentation is not required. So now we're trying to uh, uh, draw uh, some kind of roadmap when we use a ForkNet, when we use a ContNet, or when we use a combination of them, uh, uh, which is actually based on the different applications in this field. Yeah, 
sounds like a very good idea. Also, I was wondering whether the forknet and subforknet can somehow be merged into a single network. Uh, I have tried, but it's actually uh, uh, it's it's uh, how to say it's it, it takes a long time for the computing for just the one of them. So I tried once to merge both of them in a single network, but uh, the computing facilities here are, are not supporting so much. So yeah, it, it it will take long time for training. So I prefer to do the keep them uh, split it away so that it can be reasonable. It can be trained in reasonable, reasonable time. The software actually for courses uh, freely available. So I can um, I can share you the link for the GitHub site. But the, that, the problem, that, yeah, that, 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 the code is actually open source. So you can look at it if you like. But the problem is that the, I use the Mathematica for the programming, which is not so common. In, in this field, people usually prefer to use Python or something. But uh, because uh, my background in Mathematica is good, so I try to implement in this one. That's interesting that you, that you use Mathematica. But still, uh, I'm I'm quite amazed that you also share the software and so on. So it would also be really great if you could could later share the links to the GitHub repositories. Um, oh, yes, such, definitely. Such that our audience uh, can can check out the code and and experiment yeah, yeah. with sure. it sure. that's also very cool that you are so open and share this so thank you <laughs> yeah you're welcome so one thing about the uniformity of the conductivity when you create the conductivity from the segmentation maps they are always uniform because the segmentation maps are uniform Yes. And it looks like the non-uniformity that is produced by the networks is is more realistic, as far as I understand. And uh, yes, mm, somehow. So, so is is there a good way of 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 tackling this? Which one? Which yeah. So, uh, uh, I would like also to say that the, it's still an estimation. This is not exact conductivity. Because uh, to have a good measure of conductivity, we need to have a lab experiment. So uh, the, the values actually we have used here is based on the studies of the tissues that obtained usually from animals. So uh, that, that this is how, how it works in this field. So people are actually using the conductivity values uh, that is uh, appear frequently in the literature and based on experiment that's mainly obtained from experiment on animal tissues. So what we have done here is an estimation of the conductivity, uh, which is uh, not exactly the true conductivity, but it looks like closer to the uniform one. The observation that we see is that the uh, the change or the boundaries between a different tissue are looks uh, smoothly transition or represent smooth transition from one tissue to the other, which is likely to be a more realistic than char boundaries. We, it, we think that the, the human uh, tissues are not uh, having the sudden change of conductivity values from the, for example, the fat to the skin but it is likely to have, uh, how to say, a slightly changing values, which is um, more, uh, how to say, more, uh, uh, more likely uh, close to the estimation by continent. Mm -hmm. So this is why we think that the, the estimation of the electric conductivity by using continent is more realistic because the boundaries are not sharp. We don't have a sudden change of the conductivity value, like the one we have when we do the segmentation and then assigning uh, a uniform values. And it appeared that the, when we use a non-uniform conductivity, we can have a more smooth distribution of the electric field and less artifacts that appear when we use a, a uniform conductivity. What I also found very impressive is that you can work with different vendors and you still get 
essentially quantitative results. So did you have all of the vendors included in the training data or did this essentially, was this produced only from a single vendor? Uh, the, what we have done is very simply that, that we do the, you, you know, yeah, how to say, we do a, a normalization of all the data. So before uh, doing the, uh, so the, the, the training data is actually from one vendor, but the testing data is from different vendors. But all the data are actually normalized. So try to do the normalization to have the, uh, how to say, the images look like, uh, how to say, or represented within the scale from zero to one. That's it. And then we try to, when we try to estimate that, conductivity or elliptical conductivity. Of course, we can see some variations, but within, um, how to say, a limited scale, or we, we, we can see the change within uh, um, the range uh, around the true value. Uh, this is interesting because uh, I, I think, I, I was thinking about this point um, uh, and how, how it come that the images from different vendors with different distribution of grayscale can lead to almost a good estimation of the electric conductivity. And uh, I think that the, because the network is not trained only, uh, the, train, the trained network is not based on the intensity value only, but also it has also trained on the uh, spatial region or the, um, the, the, the location also of the different tissue. So it, um, I think, it, uh, how to say, both information, the location of the tissue and the intensity value contribute to the estimation of the electrical conductivity. So maybe this is the reason why we can have a good estimation, even if we change uh, or we have data from different vendors. Very impressive and of course, very good news uh, because But I'm also amazed that it doesn't involve more sophisticated rescaling, like a histogram match or something like this. But it's just a, a normalization. Simply, simply normalization, yeah. That, that's what we have done. Very impressive. So one question about the SAR results. Um, so if I look at the images that you've shown, it appears that most of the energy is actually deposited in, in the tissue and this and like before the skull and only very few energy is actually deposited in the brain so is this something you would have expected is this known or um what, what does this have in terms of implications for the mobile phone usage uh yeah so for the sour application this is actually different from brain stimulation so uh usually the the sar values are Uh, distributed on the shallow region of the head and not go into the uh, deep regions of the brain. It depends on, actually on the frequency. So when we have a low frequency, we can have a more deep uh, distribution of the SAR value. But if we have a high frequency, we have a shallow distribution of the uh, SAR values. And also uh, from these images, you can see that the, when we have a low frequency, the intensity is small, but when we have high frequency, the intensity becomes higher. So uh, the target of this application is not to look at the effect of the brain, but we look at the, how the SAR distribution can be estimated uh, by using the coordinate, which means that without using the segmentation. So the, the target here is, is it possible to estimate the SAR distribution for some uh, person directly without having the segmentation. So we compare both approaches by doing the segmentation, assigning the uniform uh, dielectric properties for different tissues, and by directly using the train continent. The good news is that the, both of them, uh, they having a comparable results uh, from both the distribution of the SAR values and from the uh, computationally, which means that the maximum value uh, and, uh, and the distribution region. And the, so how do you model the positioning of the antenna um, with the continent? 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not the expert for the electromagnetic. So this actually done by uh, my co-author who, uh, who is more uh, familiar with the antenna and how to model the antenna and how to make the position. So he recommend the, the setup to have the antenna around uh, uh, 20 millimeter from the uh, from the head. And he say, this is, um, uh, how to say, this is very common simulation when we consider the use of mobile phone. So the antenna becomes uh, about 20 millimeter from the surface of the skull. And then the frequencies we have used in this experiment is relatively close to what is used in mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And then again, you have to hold the mobile phone to the ear, right? So it's uh, not that you can yeah. listen to someone by putting your phone here, right? It doesn't yeah, make sense. It's model to be here, yeah, close to here. Yeah. So there's there's not so many options how you can hold a mobile phone. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> It was a huge pleasure to to have you here, at least virtually. Thank you. Thank you it very kind much. of it kind of relieves a bit this this lockdown feeling that you can still, you know, invite people from all over the world and get in touch, although travel is not possible and even having a haircut is not possible right now for me. <laughs> so <laughs> at least we can still talk and, and share our insights on science. So it was yeah, really I, I a don't... pleasure to have had you here. Yeah, I, I don't worry so much about the haircut as you see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, for giving this very interesting talk. And I really enjoyed seeing your results and your approaches. So thank, thank you very much. And uh, I have another round of applause for you. Yeah, you've seen that Isam had a lot of things to show. In particular, he had many segmentation and image-to-image -image transformation methods that he presented here. So if you're interested in his work, I will also publish links to his publications and software below this video. So there you can check also the implementation and reuse what he already released as open source software. So I think this is a pretty nice contribution. And of course, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the comments or you can send them to me by email or social media and I will forward them to Isam. So thank you very much for watching and looking forward to seeing you again in the next episode of Beyond the Patterns. Bye bye.